Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. So it's track roller time. As you can see, we've got four on the floor that I've disassembled and cleaned in the evenings after work this last week. These other four up here, well, the goal is to get those to that same state by the end of this episode, hopefully a little bit further. But first, a little bit of housekeeping to do from the last episode. I can't believe nobody noticed this. Or maybe you all did see it and nobody thought it was worth mentioning. Either way, it's all right. Just trying to see if you guys are starting to think like a mechanic, you know, because sometimes it's the smallest details that make or break a job. There's been times where I've been a hero for flagging things that have got past other people. There's been other times where I've been a zero for letting something small just go right through my field of vision and then the job goes south. You never remember the jobs that went well, but you always remember the ones you got burned on. And it doesn't take very long before that kind of, it does something to your brain where you don't even realize it's doing it, but you're being super analytical and observant about everything that's in your field of vision all the time, even outside of mechanics. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a super smart person, not, you know, any more than the average, I would say. And, you know, I always do well in school with like English, writing, composition, history, science. History was awesome. I mean, I like old things. So, you know, but I can't do math, you know. It's like I can I can do trade math. I can I can get a C in algebra. Anything beyond that, it's like the circuits just don't connect. It's just not there. It's always been that way. So I could never be an engineer, but I can be a mechanic. And you know, I'm just like uber patient and hyper observant. So yeah, it's that that combination works. But I got I get off on tangents. Let's get back on topic. The only other thing I wanted to briefly touch on from last time, and then we'll get on with the show, I promise. But this came up in the comments section so much that I thought it was worth revisiting. A lot of people were wondering how the grease actually got into these new bushings that we put into these track frames. So I mentioned, you know, the grease fedding with the tube goes in that street L right there. That's how grease gets fed into there. We have to keep this off until we get the recoil spring in. Otherwise, it blocks you from putting that bolt in. But I'll... Uh, We'll go back to the bench here. I have a drawing, I think, that'll show it better than these things sitting on the floor. We'll go back to the old notebook here. I think it was two episodes back. I'll pop a link here if you guys want to go and refresh your memory. I sketched what this cross section of those track frames would look like if we cut them like straight down here and looked at them from the side, explaining how those bushings are installed into the tube. So. Yeah, these are the early first gen track frames, so the grease enters from the top here about where this arrow is. All the later ones, they put a grease fitting out here on the end cap that basically captures your pivot shaft inside here. Your fitting would be on the end cap out here. These early, early ones, it's in the middle. It, either way, grease still gets in just the same. But for 1113, the grease would enter through your grease fitting tube right here and we'll pretend this ruler is the pivot shaft. So if we put that edge of the ruler up against where the bushings are, you can see we've got this whole open space in here that's going to be filled with grease. That grease is going to work its way around the pivot shaft and then because of those um, grooves that we machined into the bushings, it will just work its way through those grooves and around the shaft and then eventually squeeze out to the end where it's going to be either caught by the grease seal or trapped by the cap that's out here on the end. So the shaft will be well lubricated inside the bushings and everything will stay happy. Another question was, won't the pressure from the grease gun pushing the grease in just want to push the bushings out of the tube? That's a flat no, because these are way too tight of a press fit to just be dislodged by a uh, grease gun. Um, they probably could be if it was com a completely sealed unit. It's not sealed because we still have a clearance spec between the bushings and the shaft. And if anything, you'll push the grease seal out, but you're not going to move the bushings at all. So that's all I wanted to explain from the prior episode. Let's get busy on track rollers. Now, in this episode, we're only going to be rebuilding the earlier style track rollers that were found on the J-Series tractors. Yes, they have two types, early J-Series here, later U-Series here. Externally, these are all the same. All critical dimensions line up between the two. You could swap these with one another or even run an early J next to a later U on the same track frame. Not know the difference because spacing, bolt pattern, shell diameter, flange thickness, all the same from the outside. Inside, they're two totally different animals. So probably the easiest way at a glance to tell the difference between the two, the later U series have this flange that is cast into the cap to protect that alumite fitting. The earlier J's do not, they're actually flat on the front. 
Reason for that being, these J-series caps basically are straight through bore, so that bushing also makes up the end wall of that cap. You can see on these ones I've already cleaned up, yeah, that's bushing, it comes all the way out to the end, you can see it in there, and the alumite fitting just threads right in there. So if I press that bearing out, that bushing, that's just a straight through hole. Whereas the later U-series caps, yeah, that's just a straight through bushing in there, and the cap wall is completely integral to the rest of it. So another thing, well, we'll just take these caps off real quick and I'll show you all the differences on the inside. So these earlier J-series rollers, they had these gigantic lip seals in here to keep the grease in. They sealed against this, uh, this outer surface of that hub and great big old huge thrust washers in there. Whereas the later U-series caps, yeah, we had bellows seals with a lot smaller thrust washers in the middle. So this is very similar to the bellow seals that are uh, behind the drive sprockets. These are just a lot smaller. Here's an example of one that I pulled out of a, an old roller. And yeah, you can see there's usually a rubber gasket goes back here. We have a rubber compressible midsection and a cork facing that's glued, you know, on the front that seals against this thrust washer here. So not only are, you know, these hubs different diameters, the interior profiles of these roller flanges are different. The caps are different. The bearings are different. The seals are different. So yeah, that's why you can't run one type parts in another type roller. It's, it's all or nothing, complete assemblies on those. So now that we know what we're looking at, let's finally start taking something apart. Okay, so I'll just walk everybody through the process on one roller. As you probably saw earlier, I've got four of them disassembled, clean, and inspected already. I did that in the evenings after work this last week and hoping to get the other four to the same state today. And undercarriage work is heavy, it's dirty, and it's monotonous. It's so many of the same steps carried out over and over and over again. You just kind of turn into a robot after a while and just uh, go through the motions. So first thing we'll do is just pull each of the bearing caps off. And we're seeing a little grease in there, which is a good thing. Next, I'll put the bearing cap in the vise, get a good hold on it, and you can see I've scraped some of the grease out around. There's three machine screws around the perimeter of that seal. Let's get some the rest of the grease out of the slot on that one. Those are put in so that the head is just above the lip of that seal. It helps to retain it in the cap. So these usually come out pretty well, especially if they've been covered in grease like this. Yep. Sometimes if they really stick, you can put an impact driver on them and give them a crack and then they usually come loose. Now I've got the seal exposed and these are really a quality seal. You will not find anything like these on the market today. Cat really designed these well. Super heavy duty, very difficult to remove if you don't know really you know how to do it. And it's a one piece seal, just about an inch deep, all metal construction. And it's not really a double lip seal, but they have a felt ring here on the outside to kind of prevent the larger pieces of dirt and grit, whatever, from getting into where the actual leather lip seal is in here. So that leather lip is what holds the grease in. This felt ring is what keeps the worst of the dirt out. And you need to be careful removing them because if you just go at it the conventional way, like with a hammer and chisel, uh, I think that was this cap over here I found. Yeah, you can see lots of chisel marks around that cup face in there where somebody had been in trying to get under that old seal and pulling it out at one time. So I think a couple of other of these had, yeah, we got quite a few chisel marks around that one. I think, yeah, this one too, you can see a lot of scarring in there. So I don't like to do that. I'll show you how to actually disassemble this seal so that you don't hurt the cap at all. The first thing we need to do is open up this kind of rolled edge right here that's over the top of that backup ring. So I'll just take a narrow chisel and get under that and just start heaving it up. That usually does it about halfway around, just open it up a bit. And now that we've got some of the tension off that backup ring, we can get under it and start working the felt ring out with a pick. Here we go. And just get the felt peeled right out of there. 
And as long as we're here, I might as well get underneath that heavy spring that's behind the leather lip. Now I can wedge a pry bar beneath this uh, top backup ring, start curling it out. Just get behind it here and just open that up. Now we go back in and start lifting the secondary ring that's below this top ring. And if you can get the secondary ring loosened up, it will disengage itself and the primary ring at the same time. So. Lift it enough to get under it from out here. There we go. They both just loosened up. Two pieces out of the way. And we've got a bunch of old grease to dig out of here. It's handy to get that out of the way so you can tell what you're looking at. Now we can pry out the retention ring for the leather lip. And dig the leather out. Now all that we're left with is the metal housing for the seal, so we start collapsing that inward now. Usually at this point now I can get it with a vice grip and curl it out. Yep, there it is. The whole seal's out. The only thing left in the cap now is the thrust washer, and sometimes the grease can really stick those in place. There we go. And we have, well, a pretty much disassembled cap ready for cleanup. Didn't hurt a thing. And like I mentioned earlier, undercarriage work is repetition. We'll just carry out all the same steps on the other cap. There. Pretty simple really and that whole process is actually for me quicker than trying to get under those seals, you know, as one assembly and then just get them pried out and they don't it doesn't damage anything either. So that's how I prefer to do it. So that's really all the disassembly we have to do on the caps at this point, at least until we get them degreased and we can uh, see what we're looking at. We'll make sure that Alumite fitting is good. We'll make sure the bearings all look good. I don't expect for there to be any problems with these because there has not been with this set up to this point. It's a really, really low wear set. We had one thrust washer on the outside. We had a thrust washer with a shim on the inside. That's pretty common to see and we probably will be putting shims in when we assemble all these to the track frame, but that's still a little ways off. Really nothing else to take apart on the main roller other than getting all the old grease out of the center passage of that shaft. That's actually kind of fun. Set that roller on the vise for this. So the best way I've found to push that grease out of that shaft is a couple of extensions with a socket that closely matches the inside of the shaft. So stick it in the one side, just push it all on through. And before it hits the floor, we'll get our grease cup over here. I don't know why this is so much fun, but it is. There we are, cleaned up. 
All right, it's some time later and I've degreased and de-rusted this entire roller and inspected everything. Pretty happy with what I found. Again, it's just, you know, it's in just as nice condition as the other four that I've already cleaned. So yeah, we have, well, good sealing surfaces on these, these caps here and here can be replaced. They are a press on, but we don't need to do anything with that. And you usually have to wreck them to get them off anyway. So sealing surfaces are good. We checked the caps over and bushings inside are excellent they're like brand new literally um we can see on this one yeah right there you see those three scars on that edge that was from someone in the past trying to dig one of those great big roller seals out in one piece it just if you're not careful you can really inflict a lot of damage but yeah we've degreased it and de-rusted it and mounting flange surfaces we want those to be absolutely clean no nicks or burrs either that has to be a clean metal on metal fit if your rollers are going to stay tight in the frames clean and assess that alumite fitting it's all good we cleaned out the threaded holes in each cap so and we're making messes with the, the little seal screws that's all right same for the other one yeah everything's looking great and what you want to do also is assess the condition of these four pockets that the thrust washers go in you can see each thrust washer has two tabs on it and it uses two of the four pockets when it's set in there and that's what keeps it from rotating but you want to uh, you definitely want to check them over you can see this one has started to wear a little bit on on the tabs and you can see right here off my thumb the ramps that that forms as those start twisting out so it's all right to reuse this cap that's why they gave you four pockets to use you can take a, a washer that still has two good tabs and just disregard the two worn pockets and throw it with the tabs in the two good pockets. I've got more of these thrust washers, new old stock, so when they're worn like this, I'm probably just gonna replace them. You could probably get by with this in a pinch yet if you flipped it over so that these, these ramps are facing up. That way it's not trying to uh, walk its way out of the next two uh, series of pockets. So that usually happens when you let your end play inside the, the roller caps get too, too loose and these things can actually pop up out of those pockets and start turning that's where these little shims come into play that in alignment we'll get into all that later and yeah testing the fit on these they're just i mean that's new you just don't get any better than that spec is i believe 11 to 14 thousandths new max allowable 50 and we are well within that these on the other hand are not so yeah these are d2 caps um the, they're the later U series as you can tell these were on the iron mistress when i brought her home that's how bad the undercarriage was on that poor tractor and look this is what happens when operators never grease their machines you can see there's just a little bit of the bushing left in the bottom of there it's just u-shaped now the whole rest of it's gone and yeah it was a dozer tractor oh, because you can see we have one large pocket worn there which would have been probably predominantly forward motion and then a smaller pocket worn there which was reverse but yeah that's um that's bad this one's even worse and look how much of that cap is just gone it's it's curling material over on the edge and look at look at the hole that that roller shaft wore it's amazing how far those things will go but these roller shafts are so hard in these cat d2 rollers if you let these things run dry, they'll just start milling out material and they'll keep going. They'll go right through the cap, right through the roller frame and just keep on traveling. These tractors don't care. Yeah, these were two, these are two of the worst D2 bearing caps I've ever seen for track rollers. I can't throw these pieces away. They're just, they're just too awesome to look at. But now we've got this roller completely cleaned up. Three more left to go. Hoping to get that far yet today. Time to turn the camera off. I'm going to get busy. Okay, everybody, we did it. All the rollers are disassembled, cleaned, inspected. That's always the worst part of a D2 undercarriage job is just getting all that old grease out of these things, getting it all cleaned up, checking it out, seeing what you've got. And pretty happy with everything. It's all in really good shape. Only found a couple of thrust washers that had lost the tabs, which is fairly common to see. So not a big deal. We've got some new old stock to replace those with. And it's actually the next day. Yeah, we invested way more time into this yesterday than what I had wanted. And I was so close to having it all done except for one hang up. We'll go over here. This guy, the odd man out. So what's different about him? Well, you can see there's no holes for those machine screws around the perimeter. 
to hold that seal in. This is a first generation Caterpillar D2 roller cap. These were almost all replaced back in the day. Really, uh, really rare to see one of these here still. We'll just set this guy here for now. I'll show you the parts manual. It says serial number 5J1 to 5J1614. Use that first gen cap with no auxiliary means of retention for that seal. So starting at 1615 and up, they put those three machine screws around the perimeter, holds that seal in. So here is another first gen cap that I have. You don't see many of these, like I said, but I've scraped enough grease away for you to see. That seal has worked its way about a quarter of an inch out already. And for as tight as these fit in the caps, I don't know how they can work out, but they always did. And it became enough of a problem. They decided to add those screws, holds it in. So I dug in my parts pile. This is a good cap. It cleaned up well. All it needed was a new bushing. You can see this one, it gets real thin on the wall at the top there. That's a lot of wear. So we really haven't done any overhaul yet. Let's take the new condition bushing out of this first gen cap, press it into this second gen cap, and we'll have a set. There we are. Bushing going into the cap that we want to use and because we've already been pressed in once and pressed out, I'm backing it up with a little bit of sleeve retainer, just for good measure. Just take it on in until we're flush with the cap. Good there. Liking it. One last thing to do. I want to test it on that shaft just to make sure. Yep, that bushing is still at spec. So that's our complete set. We've got all second generation caps that'll hold the seals. And next episode, we'll roll into setting these rollers up to the track frames. We'll be setting in place, setting alignment. Once all that is in place, we'll do the reseal, final lube, final assembly, and hopefully the bottom or the lower track roller chapter will be done. Speaking of seals, yeah, lots of dirty, junky stuff in that tray, but out with the old, in with the new. Lots of stuff in that box. That's, uh, yeah, undercarriage work just gets ridiculous fast. Um, you're buying so many components and there's so much labor and that's why not a lot of modern shops do a lot for like rebuild or overhaul and under undercarriage is pretty much all just replace once it gets worn out because you know labor's just so ridiculously expensive. Manufacturing processes have got the price point down to the down to the zone where you can pretty much just buy new and put it all on and your money ahead rather than trying to you know reclaim old so also another indicator of why you want to start out on a used crawler with the best undercarriage possible because we're not really doing rebuild here we're pretty much just doing like a clean and reseal and just with a few thrust washers and all those seals the cost is ridiculous uh, if we were doing like new bushings and bearings and all that stuff in, in all of those it's it's crazy so all right, I can tell by the files on the camera we went long with this one. Once my uploads exceed 25 minutes, life starts getting a little bit stressful for me out here with my system and my slow internet. So I better just stop talking. Thanks for sticking it out with us. Um, thanks for watching. It's probably going to be another, I'd say, longer period than usual between episodes again for this next one because it's just going to be a lot of hours of me back here by myself just doing monotonous work. You can't film most of it. So yeah, we're working on it, even if the feed does seem a bit dead lately. So thanks everybody. Hope to see you back again.